Hey, it looks like folks are out there. Hello, Michael. I'm Margaret and Paul. Hello. Now you can say something. Hi, Kathy. We've seen Tom, but we haven't been able to see you lately. Been hiding. Hey, ship me one of those, will you, Paul? Sir, what? Ship me one of those, please. Ah, well, I would, but it's a little far. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Maybe you could send it electronically. Uh, yeah. huh, okay, well, this is as good as it gets, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Gordon. There are. Someone is muted. The person who says he's the owner is actually David Lawless. I think I'm, I'm on. Yes, you are. So I've got people joining. Hello, Halls. Are you Jeanette? I like that that background for Michael. He he's a he's a famous kaleidoscope collector. Betty, your sound is messing everything up. Kathy, it looks like you walked in without stumbling. Well, I'm sitting on my walker. <laughs> He's using a rollator today. <laughs> when you go breaking your foot, you don't get around as fast. Hi, everybody. Who mm -hmm. all's there? Mm -hmm. Marie Weaver, where are you? somebody in by phone, that's, that's going to make it more difficult to see the uh, presentation that we've got going. Anna Wilson, hello. Well, there's Anna. Hi, Anna. <laughs> She's muted. Everybody's muted. So well, sure. everybody should be by now. But what I want to do is introduce to everyone here um, our program for today. 
Uh, the first part of which um, David Lawless is going to bring us a message about how this whole thing about the new Graybill house got started and what happened to make it come into the realm of reality. And then I'm going to share a uh, uh, it's a, a video actually um, PowerPoint of the construction of it. I had thought that I would get further with it, but it turned out that um, just the time <laughs> that we spent building the building took up my whole allotted time. So um, as a, um, we're, we'll get as far as we can. And so I'm just going to have to do another one because all I got to is the exterior. There was, as you might guess, a whole lot more going on on the inside than the outside. But some of the outside is more fun to watch. Anyhow, um, David, why don't you start us off? OK, um, I'll do this quickly, but um, I think the, this whole situation began with some of you will remember Jim Mason, who also did a lot of our landscaping for us, where he and his family were staying with us. and. The they were staying in the loft and he came down those steps of the loft and then went underneath to look and he realized that our building because of the way it had been constructed when the building behind us created a common wall between our two buildings that whoever had done that um, had taken good care of their side but our side was was falling in to their side and everything was beginning uh, to slope in that direction and and move as the joist hangers were beginning to slip down the concrete wall. So he said, and I had never noticed that. And he was the first one that came to me and said, we're in trouble. And um, the um, uh, thing that, that then that led to was um, kind of having um, some, uh, conversations um, with the various members of our staff and board and Bill McDermott, some of you remember Bill, um, he um, had two brothers that were relatively close by that were architects that had specialized in old buildings. So they came and looked at our two buildings and their conclusion was that the headquarters house could last indefinitely as long as we took good care of it but they said the Grable house is going to fall down uh, which kind of caught us by surprise and then um, we got a structural engineer in to look at it and when he had finished his review he said and this is this is something that I hate to say but he said this house is very poorly built and it actually is a chimney the way that the walls are built, if we ever caught on fire, this thing would be gone in a few minutes. And to have the responsibility of having guests with that being the situation um, made it hard for me to sleep all during the season. Um, but we immediately started to see what we could do. And um, I remember the first conversation I had with board members Carol David was one of them. I remember early in conversation because she was an important person on the board at that time, as she is now. But um, the uh, when we had the conversation in the board meeting, Dick Kyle said, um, no, we're not going to tear the building down. And I said, well, Dick, it's going to fall down on its own. And he said, well, if it does, we won't build anything new. We'll just have a nice vacant lot next to us and that kind of was his position as our one of the members of our board from the beginning um let me just jump ahead real quick and say i was never more 
thankful and joyful when I saw him come to the dedication of the new building with a big happy smile on his face. <laughs> really big saying, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> but um, we, we had um, uh, Ted First, who's an, uh, one of the important people on the institution grounds and was on the board of trustees, um, introduced us when he heard about my conversation, um, introduced us to a person by the name of Bill Lobsher, who is an architect that was doing a lot of things on the grounds. And Bill uh, came together and he did an architectural drawing and did the estimates on the cost. And um, he was the one who first said, it'll be about $1 million and it can be done. This old house can be taken down and the new house can be constructed in one off season, but you'll have to be sure we start at the very beginning and it depends on the contractor. So immediately, Bay and I started having conversation with neighbors. We had, we had come in and because of the way we had operated for years, um, the board had done all the repairs on our, both of our houses for years. And, but they, and many of them came part of the season but they had, and the host just came in the day before the season started and left the day afterwards. So we had no real relationship with our neighborhood. And we are the only denominational house that is completely surrounded by private owners. All the rest have facing something else, but we are completely surrounded by private owners. So Bay and I realized they don't like us. And we've got to figure out what to do. So very early in our time there, we started staying, coming a week early and staying a week late and really spending time getting to know our neighbors. And then, um, but when I showed them the picture and the, and this wonderful, um, uh, and this, this wonderful model that uh, Bill Lobster had done, and it was really to scale, but some way he had done it in a way that it really looked like our house was not that in, obtrusive <laughs> in, into our neighborhood. So it was a good thing to take to the, to the architectural review board and others. And immediately the neighbors did not like the fourth floor and the fourth floor also had a porch looking down on them. So in conversations with them, we really stepped back and Bill Lobster redid the fourth floor where it is not, doesn't show that much uh, from the street and we took the porch off. And so that began to at least show the neighbors that were willing to listen to them. And we began to get at least tentative support from many of them. And um, then we went of course the architecture review board and they took the position, we don't like to tear down anything at Chautauqua. So immediately we started the process of trying to convince them and told them what our, 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 our structural engineer had said, and they got their own structural engineer to come and do a report. And the day he was, he asked that architecture review board, all five members to come and walk through, let him to show them, you know, the house. And at the end of the meeting, the guy who had been my biggest, uh, conf confronted us the most with not doing anything, pulled me over to side at the end of their conversation with their and said, David, I think you better tear this place down and start over. And so it was a, a fascinating kind of experience with the Architectural Review Board. And um, then uh, at the, at the, uh, right after that, when they said go and we were fitted and we got, we were then select the construction company that was to do it. Is the person that's head of that, of course, is, is Chris Keith. And the first time that Tom and I met with anybody on this was when we were meeting at Bill Lobster's house with our architect that had been, I mean, with our um, construction company that had been chosen. So at that point, Betty and I had created all this mess. So we turned it over to Tom and Kathy to clean it up. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's a, tell you, you, you've got a fascinating history there. And uh, the, the whole idea of doing this um, was something that 
um, in, a, in a risk management sense, really there, there, there was very little choice in it. I'm gonna take you through, and I gotta tell you, I've never done this before. So I've gotta share a screen with you. Um, and um, what I wanna do is um, share with you um, a, uh, a screen or a, a uh, program that I've created. Um, no. um, that uh, this is this is a a. Uh, uh, I don't know. Somebody would tell me if you can see this when it comes up. David, can you tell me if you can see this? We haven't seen anything yet, Tom. Nothing. Okay. Um, Other than a lot of good looking people. Yeah, well, that's, that's the... Uh, problem with it is we're always in this COVID time, we're always doing new things. And uh, so I'm going to be doing yeah. a new thing here. Okay, come. now the question is how we got from where David just left us. Here. A little bit of a difference. <laughs> um, subtle, but, but noticeable. Um, as you might know, major transitions are never really that easy. Um, and so, we uh, had to start tearing the thing down and we had a, a really a serious issue of our time goal. As David said, Bill Lobsher explained to us that it was very critical that our, uh, the builder we selected be able to uh, get the whole thing knocked down and a new one built within one off season. That's one of the reasons why we selected Chris Keith. Uh, Chris has a reputation for getting the job mm -hmm. done. And um, he, he was very much convinced that we could do it. So we got ready to tear down the old building and lo and behold, we found that there was asbestos. Any of you recall back in the back of the building, uh, where the laundry was, it was about 80 square feet of asbestos vinyl pile. And that all had to come out by remediation. The uh, contractor, the, uh, uh, we had a consultant who found it and said, this has to come out. We finally found that there were only two uh, contractors in the area who are licensed to do remediation of asbestos. Finally got one to come in and work, and he did the job and all the plastic, and everything. Well, lo and behold, he only did half of it. And so when the uh, when the uh, inspector came back, he said, "Sorry, folks, but uh, half of it's still there. You got to you do that." So the guy came back and they uh, removed the second half. We got our de demolition approval letter dated October 30th, 2018. Final demolition only began on November 4th. So we were more than a month late starting. We 
We knew that from now on, everything had to go perfectly in order for us to make our June 27th opening deadline. Um, you can see here on the, on the right, all these two by sixes lying there. Chris had these guys build a balustrade against the west side of our building to prevent demolition debris from crashing into our next door neighbor's house. And when they went to take down the um, steel fire escape off the west end of the building, the, uh, the guy hit it with a sledgehammer once and it fell. Um, I shudder to think what would have happened if somebody ever had needed it. The uh, problem was as soon as they began to dig, they found out a stream was running under the property. A hole had to be filled in and the engineers designed a remedy for it. It's clear that we had to stop the flow of soil from Penny Kurtz's house into our foundation. The answer was uh, we needed to construct soldier pilings uh, to hold back the flow of water and soil. And due to the, I, I know you've all heard of pile drivers, well due to the, the uh, fragile nature of the buildings that surround us, pilings have to be drilled into place rather than being driven into place. The uh, engineer told me that if we tried to drive them in, which would have been a whole lot less expensive, all the china in the neighborhood would have been on the floor within about 10 minutes. And some of the walls might have fallen in some of the old houses. Drilling alone cost around 130,000 and then all the materials and additional labor and equipment costs ended up, were about 70. In the, the worst part was the engineers said that it usually takes six to eight weeks to schedule such a job. And I knew that such a delay would make us unable to open 2019 Dockwell Assembly. The miracle is that one of the three drilling companies in the area, there was only one who would even talk to us about this project, owing to our need for quick action. They happened to just have received a new drilling machine, which incidentally cost $2.4 million, and they were eager to use it on a job that they had scheduled in Buffalo. And that freed up a similar drilling machine, and it would be available within a week and a half. It began operating for us on November 9th. And uh, here's, uh, you can see what a, a uh, two and a quarter million dollar uh, drilling machine actually looks like. Um, it's a huge puppy, and it, uh, it was pretty amazing. So here, if you look at the uh, soldier pilings were installed, you can see them. There are all these steel beams. Those are actually uh, 14 by 14 inch H beams uh, located uh, in concrete 20 feet deep. And the boards between them are all, uh, <coughs> excuse me, four by eight. Uh, oak, white oak beams. Those will be there forever. So they drilled all these pilings in our, around here also in order to hold back the, the soil. Here you can see them on the right side with what they've set up to be forms for casting our new foundation. Um, if you, and Tom, uh, in this picture, you can see how that common wall with the other house is so close. Yeah, and what you can't see on there is right up here on the common wall, there were four um, reflectors for um, use by uh, laser beams that were set over here when needed to assure that the common wall didn't begin to move. Uh, we actually set a grade beam in here that now holds that whole building back from ever invading our area. But the, the, uh, the laser beams reflector, reflectors showed that that common wall didn't move 
a millimeter during our entire construction process. If you look, here's a fascinating thing. They're gonna pour us a basement. And these guys move awfully quick. <laughs> and so did the trucks. <laughs> Thank goodness. But our, one of the cost overruns that we had was in the, um, the uh, interim period when between the time our drawings were built and our building was to be built, the code had changed and our walls here had to be 12 inches thick with uh, one inch or with three quarter inch rebar rather than eight inch thick with half inch rebar, uh, which was the original. Once they got that done, then they could lay on the deck, put in the beams, put in the roof, the floor joists, and this is the first floor going on the building. Um, right there, you can see that they brought the decking material, they bought the decking material the day I signed the construction contract, knowing that there would be a 200% tariff applied to this material the following week. Um, we, we avoided that, which saved us about $90,000. Snow or no, the crew kept building higher and higher. Here's a video of the framing for the second floor being installed. Exterior panels had been assembled in a warehouse and brought to the site on a flatbed truck. Once they were installed, the carpenters built the room partitions to fit our plan. This uh, is a fascinating look at how you work in the snow. Um, they, uh, once they got the floor decking on the top, this the next floor, then they shoveled out the snow. Um, at one point there was 11 inches of snow on the, on the decking which they had to shovel out. But as they went along here, they had to scrape it off the, all the uh, support uh, beams for the outside. The outside walls are all made of two by six material and insulated uh, with foam. The, uh, the uh, building is green rated. It has uh, no uh, noticeable areas of uh, heat leakage. We've had it uh, um, uh, infrared scanned the whole building, once it was completed, there was no place for we lose heat to the walls. As the building grew, much of the ornament, ornament, ornamentation, such as our, um, our uh, board and batten effect and the trim around the windows and the doors was added. Uh, the electrical and plumbing was being put in as it went floor by floor. As you can see here, there's air conditioners. There are air conditioners up here. It's a uh, quite an amazing uh, thing to watch as they did one floor at a time, everything got connected together. They still uh, had to be added to porches, but through um, the whole process, this part, the basic um, decking, was added as we went because the uh, support beams all run inside, so there's no way that any one of these porches will ever collapse. Um, this is what looks like on uh, April 5th, and you can see there's still quite a bit of work to do. Uh, this truck is bringing in wallboard, um, and um, here we are in June, just 13 days from ribbon cutting, we still don't have any porch railings or not all the outside is on. Um, there's no uh, way to get in, get a, a uh, wheelchair into the building. 
uh, other than David and I were practicing the fireman's carry. Um, and we uh, decided that wasn't going to work. So what I want to let you know is that um, this little exercise took me the, the time that I'd been allowed, allotted. Next time I do this, I'm going to do the interior. So look at the interior. This is this drawing on or this photograph on the left is the, the corner of our kitchen inside the way it is today. It uh, looks a little different. The one on the right is a view looking from the kitchen out here to the, um, the uh, living room. And over here is the dining room. This is a more complete look at the kitchen. Notice this is all cabinets now. Around here is the sink, or the sinks and the dishwasher and all that. And a few things have changed. So we want to leave you with this note that the effort that it took to get from that last slide of the outside on June 13th or June 6th. Um, it was made by a group of very dedicated and hardworking volunteers. In our next presentation on the building of the Graybill House, I plan to have an entire section on the cleaning, hanging of medicine cabinets and mirrors, assembly of bed frames, moving in beds, adding mattresses, moving in the kitchen, adding the dressers to all the bedrooms, and hanging the blinds in the room. It's so much more. Um, it wouldn't happen without a whole lot of uh, folks who volunteered to uh, stay with us, to uh, help us, and to get the job done. Uh, as you may recall, when we did open, the elevator was not operating. It didn't come into use until the end of week two. It was very fortunate because Week three, we had a bunch of folks on the fourth floor who were using either wheelchairs or walkers. And I was not convinced that uh, we wanted to be carrying those folks up and down the stairs. Um, so the little miracles continued to happen. Um, and uh, that pretty much ends my presentation, unless you folks have questions for either David or me. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll uh, let you get in. Well, Tom, let me just say that I think that that work you've done to create that kind of presentation will be because it'll, it'll be freestanding too, right? We're doing yeah. it with our picture. But that way we can keep that as a as a way of perpetuating this story. And I just appreciate your taking the time to put that together. There's so much more to do, but we'll keep at it. Unmute K Gay's talking. I think right here, this talking here. That's gay. That's gay. <laughs> it looked beautiful last summer. <laughs> that was a that was a lucky break, wasn't it? <laughs> can can Tom? Yeah. This is this is Rick. Can you? Uh, Quite clear on what happened to this stream. Is this is it below? Yes. Is um, it, did they run it through culverts? What? They they run it through uh, crushed rock. Um, it had been a situation where when they went to do the uh, old uh, campground, they just filled in stream beds and built tent platforms right on top of the stream. And what happens when you do that, you don't stop the water. 
So, um, so it continues to flow through the sand and silt and becomes very much like quicksand, which is what they found when they started digging. Uh, the foundation under our neighbor's house started to flow into our area. So uh, that's why they filled it back in and had to come up with an engineering plan. But um, I will say that the inspector who came and inspected the foundation before the next steps could take place said to um, Bill Lobsher, he said, I've been inspecting these things for 30 years and I've never seen such a well-built foundation. I've always thought that, that for a Christian organization, that's pretty important. I think everybody knows that Bill Lobsher did all this work for us pro bono. Yeah. And uh, we just, if you add in that cost, it would be tremendous, but we really have a lot to thank him for. That would have been another, um, well, it'd be 10% of the top cost of the whole project. Wow. So, well, that, that, is that is amazing about that stream. No. I, I still can't really picture exactly where the water's going. <laughs> Now, well, now it, it, it continues to flow as it has um, underneath, um, and um, but we have a a solid concrete foundation that won't allow it to seep in. Um, if any did, we do have a a major sump pump, um, but the. Uh, when I've been there, even during rainy periods and snowy periods and all, uh, we don't we don't get uh, that that sump pump doesn't run very much. Um, well, one of the things that you know that that whole area is moving toward the lake, and we saw a lot of that when they were rebuilding the amphitheater, and that was one of the reasons why they had to rebuild the amphitheater because the ground right. underneath it was moving, and um, the what I always worried about was that, you know, the Presbyterian house is between us and the lake. And I was afraid that they were going to go into the lake. And because they don't believe in immersion like we do, it would be a bigger <laughs> deal for them. <laughs> Especially since we would land on top of them. <laughs> One of the things we did that uh, was a little change in, in our design because of the moisture in the area. We uh, decided uh, to heat the floor in the uh, basement um, and uh, actually uh, uh, our contractor called me up and said this is what our heating contractor is proposing. And so I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, it's usually a pretty good idea, but um, I think you need to evaluate it and decide what you want to do. So I uh, found a contact at the Ohio State University uh, Architecture Department who's in the, the HVAC engineering department. And I called him up and I, I asked him what to do. And he, he would recommend and he said, well, uh, how much would it cost? And uh, I told him and he said, well, how big is your building? And I told him, he said, well, uh, if you don't do it, don't ever call me again. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> okay, what do you mean? He said, well, he says, I'll tell you something about putting in that kind of heat in the floor. It'll save you immense amounts of money over the years. For one thing, he said, it will extend the life of your air conditioners by at least 20%. And I said, well, how's that work? He said, well, it drives the moisture out of the whole building. He said, the hardest thing for your air conditioning to do in the summer is to remove the moisture from the air in the building. And since it's doing that in very moist outside conditions, you are simultaneously cooling and heating air conditioning units. You're heating them so that they don't freeze over they're cooling in order to remove the, the uh, moisture. 
is that when you re eliminate that moisture, you have fixed a big problem. I was, uh, so I told him, well, uh, then we'll do it. Can I call you back later? And he said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he said it was such a, he said, you've got probably a, a 31 month payback maximum. Well, I wanted to congratulate uh, Bill and Betty Whitaker for making this meeting. <laughs> oh, Betty, Betty, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Betty. Betty's been struggling. It took me, of course, we didn't see the, you know, how to get on earlier, and we forgot about it last week. <laughs> but so anyway, um, I've I've struggled. I was online with the you know, the three o'clock, the two o'clock thing. Oh, so yeah, you had a meeting. That meeting. went over and then you started and then I, I said, oh my gosh, and I was kept clicking. <laughs> oh, it's just a miracle, actually, that I got on. What I want to know is, we have a Santa Claus contest? <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> So all, far, David's winning. It's all about social distancing, Bill. It's helping <laughs> me a lot. It, it keeps her away from him. You got it. <laughs> That's keeping you social distancing. I can understand that. Bill had a mustache at one point, and that was all I could handle. <laughs> oh, I can handle too. <laughs> David, I want to ask you, but. Uh, my, my mother was in real estate and she and my dad eventually built a new house after she'd observed houses and thought that she had it just the way she wanted. And about three months later, she said, oh, I wish we had done this or that. So I don't remember what the, what the item was. I'm wondering whether after one season's use, you have seen things that you said, oh, we should have thought about this. Well, I, I really do feel that the end result just has been so workable with our guest, and mm -hmm. uh, and it it really is something. I, I'm all, the only thing we haven't finished yet that I really hope turns out to be something that that works is the basement, because I always saw that basement area as a place where kids and families could gather informally, even on a rainy day, and have a place to play games and to watch videos or whatever, and um, we, we really are still working on that to get that done. And now I think that, you know, <laughs> we have to finish everything. The, um, the basement, uh, the painting on the inside and the stairways, we have to finish the deck that will connect the two houses. We have to do all of the landscaping. Uh, and that has to be finished before the next season in 21 begins in the mid part of June. So uh, we're up in a way against another uh, hard working area. Our contractor says it can be accomplished. And of course we have to be ready to make it payments to him. So we really are still uh, seeking to get all the help from our members we can to raise the money we need but we're on track to do that in a good way. And uh, so, uh, Rich, I, I'm, I'm not unhappy with anything at this point. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are always little things that you look at and think, oh my gosh, it would have been nice to do such and such. And it, um, one I think of is, and we're gonna have to figure out how to do this, is uh, we didn't have lighting put in over the um, the sinks in the bedroom. What a, I don't know how, how that got, well, I do know how it got missed. When the plans were drawn, they didn't know where the sinks were gonna be placed because of the change in the size of our stairwells. Um, one of the things that happened in the transition from the original documents through the, uh, the uh, process of uh, checking code and everything, found that the, the stair 
tread depth was changed from a minimum of or a max, minimum of nine and a half inches to a minimum of uh, uh, ten and three quarter inches. So as a result, at each end of the building, we lost fourteen inches of workroom for some of the room. That's twenty eight inches to lose. And that moved a lot of things around. So in the process of accommodating that, ended up moving where they were going to be able to put sinks, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they couldn't figure all that out until they got drywall in. Once they had drywall in, the electric had already been done. So Makes we're going to work with that. And, and uh, I did talk to the electrician. He says it's not probably a very big deal. Well, that's one of the things I think is a part of the code that we had to have those two fire, uh, we had to have those two stairways, which took up so much of our internal space. And I don't think that two stairways in that size of a house really are needed, uh, but it's still the code. And when you build a house to the standards that this house was built to, and how it just will never, it, it just won't set on fire because of the way it's built. And, uh, but still it has these two massive staircases. And so that's one of the things we just got caught in that I think probably needs to be a reform to the code. So you can sure understand why in the kind of buildings we have around Chautauqua, like our old one used to be, you better damn well have two stairways. <laughs> Well, and the other, the other part of that is you look at these codes, they're, they're assembled the way they are because somebody died and an accommodation was made to try to prevent that going forward. I think that we've got, from what I can see, we have probably the safest building I've ever seen. And um, we have uh, a generator that will allow us to power um, oxygen for any um, of our residents who need it during a power outage. Uh, also keep our food from spoiling. Also uh, keep the, the furnaces running uh, and it will keep the elevator running. So we have a, an ability there <laughs> to uh, run a building safely. And uh, I think that that was the main consideration that David and I talked with the, uh, the builder about <laughs> when we were trying to decide what our criteria were. He really wanted to know what's, what's most important to you people. And I said to me, the most important thing is that we have <coughs> a warm, dry, safe place for our residents um, that they will have confidence that we've done everything that we could do to protect them from whatever might happen. Okay, so it'll, yeah, it'll be there another hundred years in the same place. Well, I, I don't want to get into Betty's presentation she's going to make on the history of us on the grounds. But in one of the things she ran into, um, there was another time <clears throat> when our headquarters house first came on and then when the columns were built, the disciples had the most and the big and the best looking denominational house on the grounds. Still and now with the work Tom and the contractor did, We've done it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. We still have it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they refer to the col they refer to the columns as lordly columns. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they are. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, I want you to know that our um, where we had the common wall behind us, it is no longer a common wall. There is a gap between us. In the common wall. Our side of it has a um, three hour firewall. Our two side walls, all the way up, are 
to our fired wall. And our front wall is a, uh, it was supposed to be a one hour firewall, but it turned out to be less expensive to build a two wall, two hour firewall there. So we are, um, we have one of the two best protected uh, buildings on the campus of Chautauqua. When you contrast that to the old Grable house with about a seven minute firewall. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the fire inspector told me. <laughs> and our, our, yeah. our neighbors love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good. I can attest to the fact that the fire alarm system works very well. <laughs> oh. And it works especially well on Saturday morning at 6 a.m. <laughs> when, when somebody's making coffee in when their bathroom. <laughs> on the fourth floor. <laughs> on the fourth floor. Our, our lips no, are sealed. <laughs> our lips are sealed, yes. Now that that uh, it does work and the police get there and the fire engines get there very quickly. <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. But well, it's an excellent way to get people moving and out of there on get Saturday. So the <laughs> we had a good turnover. Day, yeah. <laughs> we had a good turnout for breakfast. <laughs> well, that is good about having the generator because um, you have had those. You had an outage recently, didn't you? Yes. Uh, we, yes, we had an outage. Um, the whole grounds did. Uh, we also had an outage on the grounds with a storm just about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. But the one we had before, um, we um, had a guest who was on a this is years ago. Z pack. Uh, years ago. And uh, when I was telling everybody that we were going to have to do go through the night without um, electricity. She said, well, if I go to sleep and the electricity goes out, I will die. So I went running around to try to find if there was any place we could uh, find a generator. And this was about 15 years ago or so. And um, the, the, the only place that had one was the UU house. They were all having a party down there with the lights on. Everybody else was in the dark. And so <laughs> I just think it's so good to have this kind of backup for not only the, air, the, the elevator, but just for general safety. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in all of our hallways, the electrical outlets will be on at all times. I mean, if, if the power goes out. And we couldn't, you really can't make it go to all the rooms. We would have had to have twice as much generator as we ended up with. but. Um, Having the hallways, we can run uh, oxygen machines and CPAPs and the like off of the hallway. I think one of the things that's made our house so um, special to the neighbors, they all have stopped and spoken about it, are the great ferns. I mean, great ferns that Kathy grew and brought to Chautauqua to hang on each porch. And it looks like we have trees we don't yet but uh, we have greenery at least and uh, makes us look like we've been there a long time and uh, even the kids walking from work from the Athenaeum will stop and look and admire the kids don't do that mm -hmm. but they did our our late uh, guest or uh, homeowner across James from us uh, said to me last summer she said uh, I was standing on her porch um, talking with her and she said you have no idea how many people want to come up on my porch and take a picture of your building <laughs> <laughs> said, well, great are you letting them do it and she said oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> what about the lady that well, is on the one side that gave you such fit about if you damaged her plants and and uh, she was really after you. Were you able to preserve all that? Yeah, I a happy camper. I met with her a few weeks ago. Um, 
her husband has had a stroke and some other health issues. And so I was asking her how he's doing. She's not going to come up this summer uh, anymore, but she was um, so cordial. Kathy and I went over to visit her last summer um, toward the end of the season. She took us on a tour of her um, building um, and her house and wanted to show us all the antiques and sit down and have a cup of tea if we could and, and all this. And she was the lady who had said she was going to be sitting in the road in her in her chair with a shotgun across her lap to make sure nobody impinged on her property. Um, mm -hmm. She was the lady who uh, Chris Keith put up that balustrade for to keep um, any possible debris from hitting her house. Um, now she's become most cordial and uh, uh, she, uh, she, and, uh, she came over for ice cream uh, year before last and said, well, they gave us ice cream, but I'm sure not, I still don't know if I trust them. You know, she she was the one that when we were first, um, they now were first trying to get a better relationship with our neighbors. We invited them all in the week after the season was over to our house for dinner. You know, there are about 26 of them if you count all the neighbors around, because as I said, we're in the middle of all these private owners. And when during the course of the conversation at the table that night, she says, I've never, and this, you know, she is right next door. I've never been in this house before. I was afraid to do it because I always thought this was a cult. <laughs> She's a Methodist. <laughs> a, a fun <laughs> thing at the last year when we were giving tours, anybody that walked to the front door and wanted to see inside, and she and her husband came in and they wanted to go all the way to the top floor and look at their house. So many people want to come to the top floor, <laughs> the neighbors, and look at their own houses. It's pretty fun. <laughs> and they loved it. Well, they loved every well, bit you, of it. Well, you guys have just won everyone over with your charm. <laughs> the one thing that I found fascinating is by giving all these tours to people last summer, we ended up getting um, room applications or uh, from about 20 people we'd never heard of before. Um, and a number of them are younger people. Um, and as you may recall, we've been asking folks if they would be willing to convert their room payment into a donation. And what kind of surprised me was um, several of our new uh, residents who aren't going to be coming this year because they can't, uh, because of the COVID-19, have said, uh, keep all or part of my room payment. I want to, I do want to come there. And I think that there are a lot of folks who really do. I, yeah, Ellen is one of them. And I think it's fascinating that, um, I don't know about you, Ellen, but when I, a lot of people, when they see the kitchen, they say, where can I sign? Yeah, I can, I can, I can understand that. <laughs> In my case, Byron Schaefer, who is on, but he's got his picture muted, already told me what a wonderful place to stay it was. So I was completely worn over anyway. If Byron says it's true, it has to be true. Uh, <laughs> we, love, we love Byron anyhow. Go Byron, go. There we go. Hi. He, is. <laughs> he even he looks like himself. Himself. <laughs> Are they, is the recording going to be ava made available? It's yes. Whoops. The, uh, I would love we're having a room added to our little Adirondack oven, and I would love to share the um, uh, part of the uh, construction scene with the builder. You would be fascinated. Sure. Um, we're, 
last week, we recorded the thing that, uh, that Amos did, and it's now on. I just set up, and so I'm not ready to make it public yet. But it, it's on a um, YouTube channel, um, and this will be also. Our plan actually is to record and make available all of these presentations, including the ones that happen when we're back together. Um, we've looked at that and thought, you know, most people come for one week out of a season. But we have these programs every week. We ought to be able to share those with whoever wants to, to join us. They have to bring their own cookies, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tried emailing cookies and it did not work. <laughs> it's above well, and beyond, Tom. <laughs> this was wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for putting this together. And uh, we uh, we've been on an hour, so I guess we really ought to to not make everybody. Missed the next thing they were going to do. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, for, thanks hey, for all your thanks support. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you, Ben. Thank you all. Thanks Come a lot. Here. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Safe. Be well. Uh -oh.